So thank you very much for coming. I'm going to start off with two announcements about ISGAP. Number one, I've been instructed, and I think correctly so, there's envelopes on your, in front of you, and just to let you know, we'd be grateful for any donations. ISGAP is a 501c3, and all the programming we do here in, uh, in this building, and at McGill, at Harvard, at Columbia, in Rome, at Sapienza, and in France, and now we're starting a program in Oxford, we have to raise the funds for everything, so from the coffee to the events and to the scholarship. So any help, or if you know people that would help us, we'd be grateful. Uh, and the second announcement is that I just came back this morning from uh, Santiago, Chile, and on Thursday we signed an agreement and we're going to start a program. We've started a program at the University of Chile in Santiago, and we're working with really fine scholars and um, a guy named Oscar Kleinkoff, who's an amazing, uh, he's a young entrepreneur and uh, really a dynamic uh, leader, so that went off well. And then we attended, um, actually Oscar organized a conference that was supported by the World Jewish Congress and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Israel. And um, they invited young leaders from 25 to 40 years old from 10 uh, South American countries. So it was a very uh, impressive conference of young, young Jewish leaders dealing with issues of anti-Semitism and how uh, they're coping and dealing with things. So it was very interesting meeting young leaders from uh, Chile and Argentina. Argentina's reeling after the Alberto uh, Nisman assassination and the uh, situation in Paraguay, Uruguay, Brazil, it was very, it was fascinating. So it was a good few days. And uh, there's a lot of interest in ISGAP throughout, throughout South America now. So there may be more programs in the offing. And of course, so here we have, uh, an, we're honored to have Richard Landis with us today. Professor Landis is going to speak about anti-Semitism's fatal attraction the global perspective, the global progressive left, the jihadist right, and Israel as the 20th, 21st century Antichrist. And uh, Richard's been working on these issues for a long time, uh, so it's, uh, it's an honor that you're here. Thank you for coming. And I will sp just interject my two cents worth on the, on the eve of uh, the Iran negotiations where anti-Semitism and human rights are being stifled, intentionally stifled. The, the impact of this on anti-Semitism is, is deep and serious. And it's not just a problem of Israel. Coming from this conference, we see the, the silencing of issues of anti-Semitism globally really having an impact on communities. There are, there are communities in South America and in Europe that are under siege. And we have to remember that this bubble of the United States and this bubble of New York is not the global reality. So we have to be aware of what's happening. There's a lot of communities facing really serious uh, issues. So Professor Landis is a professor of history at Boston University. <coughs> he was trained and did research as a middle medievalist. His early work focused on the period of 1000 CE, a moment, in his opinion, of both cultural mutation, origins of the modern West, and an intense apocalyptic and millennial, millennial expectations. His most recent publication uh, is entitled Heaven on Earth, the Varieties of the Millennium Experience, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2011, and the Paranoid Apocalypse, a hundred year retrospective of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was printed and uh, published by NYU Press in 2011 with Professor Katz, which is a very important uh, book. I highly recommend it. So again, that's called, they're both important, but the Paranoid ap Apocalypse, 100 years of uh, retrospective on the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which touches very much on the work of ISGAP. It's a very important uh, contribution. In 2005, he launched a media oversight project uh, entitled The Second Draft in order to look at what, he, what, what the news media calls their first draft of history. 
His opening dossier was Pallywood and the Muhammad al Dura affair, which uh, you'll see in the presentation. Since 2005, uh, Richard has been blogging the new Augrian stables. In 2009, uh, just after the publication of the Goldstone Report, he and other critics put up a website dedicated to the understanding of the Goldstone Report, which was an important is an important group still today, even after the uh, Goldstone Apology. He and associates are trying to create the Institute for Cognitive War Research, whose first project is to establish the Al Dura project. He is currently writing two books, one on the Middle Ages, while entitled "While God Tarried: Disappointed Millennialism from Jesus to the Peace of God," and another book about the current situation, entitled "They're So Smart Because We're So Stupid: A Middle A Medievalist Guide to the 21st Century of Cog War." I don't, you'll explain what that 21st means. 21st century cognitive warfare. Cognitive warfare, okay. So really, Richard, thank you for coming, and it's an honor that you're here. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, privilege to... Uh, I'm going to be rude and interrupt you right, right away. I also want to acknowledge Phyllis Chesler, who's a research fellow with ISGAP, who's uh, been working on these issues for many years. And, and Al Perlmutter is a member of our executive committee. Is here. So thank you very much, oh and, and Melissa Garber is a member of our board. Uh. All right, enough with the thanks. Um, <laughs> let me apologize in advance. I am not exactly known for my um, tact, and um, I think partly I became an Israeli because uh, they have no tact either. Um, is so uh, I'm going to say things that m may strike some people as harsh, particularly at the end when I get to the Jewish contribution to this problem. Um, in advance, my apologies if I offend you, but this is not one of those safe zones that the university is trying to create, or at least I'm not going to treat it that way. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the material in this talk is based on a long period of study of mine on issues of apocalypticism, millennialism, messianism, the whole complex of sort of end time uh, concerns. We will be having a conference at Boston University on May 3rd and 4th, with which Richard Schoenfeld there on the back has helped me to organize and fund, um, which will be on the apocalyptic dimension of global jihad. Um, it should be extremely interesting, and uh, I'm, Charles will be at it, and uh, those of you who are here will get announcements in their time. So let me pass to my subject. Um, I, I'm not a public singer, so I'm not going to sing this, but imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion to. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. John Lennon, 1971. And now, imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Something to kill and die for. And one religion, too. Imagine all the people living under our peace. You may say we're dreamers, but we're not the only ones. Say this is Jihadi John. Welcome to the 21st century. Despite the spectacular attacks on the West, 9-11 being the most prominent, most Westerners have little familiarity with the jihadi narrative, a narrative first revealed in Khomeini's Iran in 1979. It varies significantly, it's an apocalyptic narrative that varies significantly in some ways from traditional Muslim apocalyptic thought, which focused on a last judgment at the end of time. That's how Muhammad started his career, by announcing that uh, judgment day was coming, and really during the early Medina period, uh, he, his feeling was that as long as you believed in one God and the coming judgment, it didn't matter what religion you were, Jewish, Christian, this was when they were still praying towards Jerusalem. Instead, this 
current apocalyptic scenario focuses on a this-worldly messianic era envisioned as the global victory of Islam, when all of Dar al-Harb becomes Dar al-Islam. How many people here know Dar al-Harb, Dar al-Islam? Okay, all right, so uh, alas, we're now 15, into our 15th year since 9-11, uh, and these are basic concepts that's, that everybody should have found out about immediately, but uh, we were really disinformed. I gave a talk to 400 people from Homeland Security, and approximately the same percent knew. Dar al-Islam is the realm of Islam or submission. It's where Sharia law rules. It's majority Muslim countries in which the Sharia is the law of the land. And Dar al-Harb is, uh, Harb is the Arabic word for cherev, uh, the sword. It's the realm of the sword. It's the realm of war. It's the realm that needs to be conquered. And essentially, in jihadi, uh, to, to sort of give a Freudian version of the jihadi formula, where there was Dar al-Harb, there shall be Dar al-Islam. And all of us, welcome you all, are harbis. That is, we are destined to the sword. So, those who join this movement fight in an apocalyptic battle in which Jews will be slaughtered and the rest of the Harbis will convert, accept the Dhimma contract of submission, or become slaves, or are put to death. A second global Islamic kingdom, only this time really encompassing the whole world, is on its way. In the battle, no mercy can be shown to those who resist Islam's coming dominion. Everything to kill and die for. Suicide martyrs go straight to heaven, their victims straight to hell. Muslim apocalyptic believers hold that the traditional great and small signs of the end, that's a traditional term in Islam, have been fulfilled in our day. The ever-growing power of the godless modern West has grown so great that it threatens Islam with annihilation, with its progressive values of tolerance and equality for all, including women and, God forbid, gays. The West incarnates the rebellion against Allah's will, the triumph of diabolic forces, including that of women mis misbehaving. One of the signs of the end, end in Islamic apocalyptic discourse is when women talk back to their husbands. Um, and who is their apocalyptic enemy in this final war of extermination? The overwhelming, indeed monotonous answer, because there's a wide range of apocalyptic di uh, discourse, both Shiite, Shiite and Sunni, is some combination of U.S. and Israel, the great and the little Satan. It is the sacred task of the jihadis to destroy that enemy in order to redeem the world by the global imposition of Sharia. Now my friend Mark, who just walked in, with whom I discussed this talk, told me I have to have a quote, at least, to illustrate the claim that the jihadi aim is world conquest. I looked at him puzzled. Anyone familiar with the literature knows how pervasive and open that ambition is. They don't, hide their, they don't hide their intentions, we hide our eyes. The very idea that 15 years after 9-11, Westerners still need quotes to prove this is evidence of the problem I'm about to discuss. But just to acknowledge that request, here's a quote, not from Al-Qaeda, not from ISIS, not from the Muslim Brotherhood, all of whom are known for their global ambitions, but from Hamas, considered even by high-ranking Israeli intelligence circles as a national religious movement, not comparable to global movements like ISIS. Here in 2002, at the height of the Intifada, is Sheikh Ibrahim Mahdi speaking about the genocidal apocalyptic hadith whereby Muslims, with the help of nature itself, the rocks and the trees, will exterminate all the Jews before the Last Judgment. We believe in this hadith. We are convinced also that this hadith heralds the spread of Islam and its rule over all the lands. O oh Allah, annihilate the Jews and their supporters. O oh Allah, raise the flag of jihad across the earth. O oh beloved, look to the east of the earth. Find Japan in the ocean. Look to the west of the earth. Find the country in the ocean. Be assured that these will be owned by the Muslim nation, as the hadith says, from ocean to ocean. Yeah. That's in the Constitution of Hamas. It's not just a quote from the Imam. 
it's in the Constitution as well. Okay. Or, as the immensely popular Islamic preacher Sheikh Yusuf al Karadawi put it in 1995, we will conquer Europe, we will conquer America. Many jihadis view the U.S. and the rest of the Crusader Christianity, i.e. European West, as mere pawns duped by the Jews, first victims of the Jewish global conspiracy to degrade and enslave mankind. Here's a quote. I'm sh cutting it short, but it's, it's really uh, grotesque. Thus, the Jewish slap on the faces of the Christians continues, who apparently enjoy this sort of humiliation and offer their other cheeks so that the Jew can continue to slap the Christians, just as we see ruling them in Europe. And now these Jews, with their duped crusaders, want to similarly degrade Islam. The Zionist world government, which governs the entire world, the Zionist American government, the United Nations and the Security Council, the Zionist world government, which are managed from behind the curtain by the Antichrist and Satan, this is a Muslim, just as the Book of Revelation points out. And one of the characteristics of Muslim apocalyptic thought in the 21st century, or really at the approach of the 21st century in the 1990s, was that it started pulling in material from Christian sources as well as UFO stuff, what we call the millennial kitchen sink. Um, they would just take anything in order to um, forward their ideologies, which is new in the history of Muslim apocalyptic, which is normally just the citing of hadiths. And the main tool whereby the Jewish conspiracy attacks Islam is Israel, that unbearable blasphemy, an independent vimi state in Dar al-Islam, a beachhead of Western decadence, including women's liberation, an infuriatingly small group of historically cowardly i.e. unarmed Jews, who hold their own in a wildly asymmetric war, war with Arab might and honor. Israel is the headquarters of the conspiracy to exterminate Islam to the genuinely paranoid jihadi, the great Israel is the great Satan, not the little Satan. These ideas, no matter how marginal their origins, have great appeal. Jihad views its path to global domination via genocide of the Jews, and a large number of Muslims today believe that Jews are, to use the uh, famous phrase uh, so beloved of the Nazis, unsa unglück, our misfortune. Jihadis believe that now is the time when one must fight back. Now is the time to destroy that Jewish conspiracy. Now is the time to restore Islam to its rightful place dominating in the world. Indeed, in their minds, the very process of modern globalization that has so terribly humiliated Islam will now become the vehicle for Islam's global domination. Western global hegemony is the preparation for the caliphate. The day will indeed come in soon when Muslims will have uprooted Israel, when the Queen of England will wear a burqa, and when the green flag of Islam will fly from the White House. These are all common tropes in Muslim apocalyptic discourse. In the late 20th century, this was more than a tall order. With the West dominating the globe, it seemed ludicrous quest, even to most Muslims. It meant conducting an asymmetrical war of conquest in which you must convince your enemies, whom you could never defeat openly, to surrender without using their vastly superior strength. For a movement with so appalling an ideology to succeed in, world, in a world committed to human rights for all seemed improbable, indeed unthinkable. After all, the global progressive left embraces a radically different path to collective salvation. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the global progressive left is also an apocalyptic millennial movement, but as I say, they have a radically different approach. For the former, that is the global progressive left, the other, and that's a term they use themselves, I'm not sort of labeling them. After all, it, it, um, for the former, the other, however queer and deviant from the norm, is to be embraced, transgress the boundaries of self and other. The sense of common humanity supersedes the tribal us-them. For the latter, that is the global jihadi right, the other, the infidel, needs to be annihilated. Either they convert, they die, or they accept subjection. 
It would be harder to find a more antithetical discourse among jihadis and progressives than the treatment of the other. In the 1990s, a global jihadi intent on destroying the godless West and imposing Sharia ruled Dar al-Islam on the whole world was just a dreamer. Westerners, hearing of this dream, laughed. Were a jihadi in the year 2000 to formulate a prayer of beseeching to Allah to further his divinely appointed global endeavor, it might have run as follows. O oh Allah, the all merciful, give us enemies who help us disguise our ambitions, even our acts of war, blinding themselves to our deployment, targeting them. O oh Allah, the all merciful, give us enemies who accept those of us who fight with dawah, that's Call, means summons. It's it's uh, um, it's a it's a nonviolent form of calling for everyone to convert. Those who fight with dawah as moderates who have nothing to do with the violent extremists. Enemies who choose these false moderates as advisors and consultants in intelligence and police services and as community liaison. Enemies who verbally attack anyone, including Muslims, who criticize Islam as Islamophobes. Enemies who believe that, except for a tiny majority, minority, the vast majority of Muslims are moderate and peaceful, and that Islam is a religion of peace. Give us enemies who adopt our own apocalyptic enemy as theirs, that's the key to this talk, Their own, our own apocalyptic enemy as theirs, Israel, so that they join us in an attack on one of their key allies. Give us enemies who legitimate our terrorism as resistance and denounce any recourse to violence in their own defense as terrorism. Give us enemies who respect the dignity of our beliefs even as we heap disdain on theirs. Enemies who believe when we invoke human rights to defend jihadis and attack them, who believe us when we invoke human rights. Enemies who introduce our intimidating street into the heart of their capital cities. And may those who so act play prominent roles in their public sphere. On the face of it, it's hard to imagine that such an implausible prayer would be answered. <laughs> Granted, the West had produced its useful idiots in the early and mid 20th century, brilliant minds like Shaw and Sartre, but any such useful infidels today would empower forces relentlessly hostile to the very progressive values they, they insisted that they were promoting. It's one thing to lie about systematic murder and repression of other people, whether it's Ukrainian kulaks or Chinese peasants. It's quite another to promote one's own enemy. And yet, Beginning in the new century, from October 2000 more specifically, there emerged a widespread programmatic anti-imperialist, anti-war alliance between the global progressive left and the global jihadi right. This alliance displayed itself on many occasions during the aughts, most prominently in the massive global demonstrations denouncing the U.S and Israel, in journalism, in academia, in international human rights. Hold on. I have a good one of, there we go. Oh, no, here it is. All right, that's 2003 uh, demonstrations against um, the United States uh, in Iraq. Yes, that's in London, over two million people. Um, BDS, one of the more sustained initiatives in this alliance, features progressives who imagine they stand shoulder to shoulder with other global anti-imperialists in opposing war, racism, and xenophobia. Meanwhile, their jihadi comrades cannot, in arms cannot believe how easily they dupe progressives into supporting their imperialist war. There's nothing more imperialist than jihad. The 21st century jihadi does indeed face the foe of his dreams and prayers. When bin Laden struck the Twin Towers, for example, uh, Jean Baudrillard, French postmodern intellectual and critical theorist, spoke for many who rejoiced at the blow to American hegemony so unbearably oppressive and so suffocating. And this is a quote from 
uh, Baudrillard in the pages of Le Monde, the same Le Monde that said the day after 9-11, nous sommes tous les Américains, we're all Americans, 10 days later published this piece. The prodigious jubilation engendered by witnessing this global superpower being destroyed. Better, by seeing it more or less self-destroying, even suiciding spectacularly, Though it is the superpower that has, through its unbearable power, engendered all that violence brewing around the world, and therefore this terrorist imagination which unknowingly inhabits us all, in the end, they did it, we wanted it. That's a French intellectual. While some sentiment led to the strengthening of transatlantic alliance, a resolve to oppose and a, a resolve to oppose jihad, 9/11 also produced widespread anti-Americanism and anti-Zionism, which only grew stronger over the course of the aughts. That's the first decade of the 21st century, including the spread of conspiracy thinking about 9/11 that literally absolved the jihadis and indicted the U.S. and Israel for this most insidious right-wing plot. By the time the collective voice of global morality in the tens of millions worldwide, that's the picture I show you, protested Bush's war in 2003, the image of the global progressives left Antichrist had taken shape. This is San Francisco in 2003. A combination of Nazism, capitalism, U.S. imperialism, and Zionism. Three years later, Judith Butler, reigning queen of postmodern theory, mistook imperial anti-Americanism for anti-imperialism, that is jihadi imperial anti-Americanism, and despite being a pacifist, welcomed Hamas and Hezbollah into the ranks of the global progressive left. She used the term. And by 2009, speakers and protesters agreed that Ham uh, that, um, uh, Protesters of the IDF's operation cast lead in Gaza shouted, we are Hamas. Had you told a supporter, had you told a, a, a signer of the paranoid genocidal Hamas charter in 1988 that within 20 years anti-war Western infidels would march in the streets of European capitals shouting victory to Hamas, he would have laughed out loud and responded, only Allah can make someone that stupid. But, you object, this is only the crazy left, the most extreme revolutionaries. And in its most absurd formulations, as above, that may be true. The problem arises from the use of the word only. For while most of the left disavow the more extreme formulations, they have nonetheless been drawn into the orbit of this powerful vortex, either by sins of commission or sins of omission. The visceral spread of anti-Zionism, the idea that somehow Israel is the world's Glück has now successfully made its way via academia to policy circles that now dominate our White House. If I were a Muslim, I would take the enduring stupidity of Western elites as a sign from Allah to join the jihad. Back in 1950s, Norman Cohn warned, it's a great mistake to suppose that only writers who matter are those whom the educated in their saner moments can take seriously. There exists a subterranean world where pathological fantasies, disguised as ideas, are churned out by crooks and half-educated fanatics for the benefit of the ignorant and the superstitious. There are times when this underworld emerges from the depths and suddenly fascinates, captures, and dominates multitudes of usually sane and responsible people who thereupon take leave of sanity and responsibility, and it occasionally happens that this underworld becomes a political power and challenges the course of history, and that I would say is what ISCAP is trying to deal with. Anti-Zionism, the soft underbelly of the West, in the aughts, jihadis invaded the West most successfully by its so via its soft underbelly, anti-Zionism. And the primary but not sole weapons delivery system was none other than one of the central pillars of Western 
democratic society, the free press. Through the intimidation and manipulation of an advocacy-oriented Western press, jihadis managed to make major strides in their assault on Jews, both the sovereign ones in Israel and the successful ones in the West. For jihadis, few victories could compare in value with the destruction of Israel, a triumph if it ever happens, of immense symbolic power. It would change the direction of sacred and global history, revive Arab pride and Muslim confidence that their religion will indeed dominate. It would make them the strong horse. It would also reveal the frailty of the West, sacrificing an ally to curry favor with an enemy, the weak horse. A new round of recruiting, a new round of intimidating public behavior and terrorist attacks targeting Harveys. Getting the West to adopt a self-destructive policy would therefore be optimal, but presumably not easy. While jihadis may have made friends with some of the more radical elements in Western culture, there were still important areas of resistance where the right of Jews to exercise sovereignty and not depend on the goodwill of others was a mainstay of the post-Holocaust moral political order. The jihadi then needed to first convince Westerners that jihadis were neither anti-Semitic, we're Semites, how could we be anti-Semitic, nor aggressors, we're only defending ourselves, and second, get them to blame Israel for the conflict and accept the notion that for world peace, Israel must be destroyed. In the course of the first years of the 21st century, jihadis won signal victories in this anti-Zionist battle. Western journalists working in the Middle East repeatedly mainstreamed as news jihadi war propaganda against Israel, framed in the post-colonial narrative of the aggressive imperialist Israeli Goliath against the plucky, resisting, victimized Palestinian David. Some of these lethal narratives had an electric effect during the aughts, angry demonstrations repeatedly filled the streets of Western and Muslim capitals, denouncing Israel in the most lurid terms and affirming full solidarity with, full solidarity with their jihadi enemies. Somewhere here I have, should have a slide for that. I don't know what it is. Okay. Academics force the conflict into the narrative Procrustean bed of post-colonialism in which Israel was the last remnant of an evil, racist Western imperialism. Tony Judd, Jewish professor at NYU, being one of the primary articulators of that point of view. And Jews, even Jews claiming to be pro-Israel, made loud and public protestations of their horror at Israeli behavior. Western intellectual elites showed an almost insatiable appetite for stories about Israel behaving badly, very badly. The key moment when the global progressive left lost its moral bearings occurred in late 2000. We can actually date it. Anti-Zionism, which had previously had limited impact on the larger discussion, now suddenly and powerfully came to the fore. While some marginal voices uh, of both right and left had adopted the Palestinian supersessionist claim that the Israelis are the new Nazis and we are the new, um, uh, the new Jews, uh, it had not really made it into the mainstream until 2000. And then on September 30th, 2000, in the words of the journalist responsible for the catastrophe, tout bascule, everything flips. There is nothing intrinsically apocalyptic about the image of Mohammed Adoura. A 12-year-old boy allegedly shot to death in the arm, allegedly in the arms of his father, allegedly by IDF troops at Netzarim Junction in the Gaza Strip. As a piece of war propaganda designed to stir hatred and a burning passion for revenge, it was well played and skillfully, skillfully manipulated by Palestinian authorities. The image rapidly took on the mythical proportions in the, in the Muslim public sphere, a symbol of the Al-Aqsa Antifada, and a fabulous recruiting device for global jihad. Poetry called for revenge, TV music videos called on other children to join the lad Mohammed in martyrdom. Every new offensive in the Antifada began with saturation of al-Dura imagery on TV. Bin Laden turned it into a recruiting device. 
عمرك الصبي تبدد محمد يا فدا ناظريك كل زعيم محمد حظه في الوغاء دان وندد محمد يا فدا ناظريك at the hands of the Jews Osama bin Laden wrote or, or said, in killing this child, the Israelis have killed all the children of the world. Muhammad's murder offered a warrant for apocalyptic genocide. The hadith of the rocks and trees became a commonplace among Palestinians. The most surprising symbolic response, however, came not predictably from Muslims, but from Europeans, who enthusiastically embraced this dubious tale as true as the emblem of the suffering Palesti uh, Palestinian and the pitiless Israeli. It proved the substitution theology of Israelis as the new Nazis and Palestinians as the new Jews, and permitted progressives in the West to fully side, um, uh, to take the side of the subaltern, oh sorry, Here's substitution theology. This is a Latouf um, favorite theme in the Argentinian um, cartoonist Latouf's work. Um, The Aldura blood libel explained everything. Why Muslims hate Jews, why Jews deserve that hatred, what the problem is, Israel, and how to fix it. Perhaps precisely because it was under the apocalyptic radar, not weighed down with explicit and ridiculous symbolism of UFOs under the Bermuda Triangle, a favorite theme in Muslim apocalyptic, but rather dressed up as a news item about something that really happened and something that fit perfectly into the post-colonial paradigm, it played a pivotal role in mainstreaming the most virulent anti-Zionism in the West. In Paris, demonstrators held aloft a great banner that equated Aldura, there's the father and the son, and the legend is they kill children. Swastika equals Star of David. And at that demonstration for the first time since the, the Holocaust, Cries of death to the Jews were heard in a European capital. Now, recently, it's become very common, and people are saying, how did this happen? And don't even seem to be aware that the first time it happened was here. There was a large crowd of leftist, global progressive leftist, human rights people, MRAP, the, the Mouvement pour uh, Antiracist, and so on, none of whom opposed these cries. Nor did such extravagant symbolic rhetoric remain on the fringes. Catherine Ney, respected U.S. Uh, can, uh, no, uh, can, respected French um, uh, news anchor, commented, "This death, sick, replaces erases the picture of the boy in the Warsaw Ghetto. This image of a child reportedly killed on a." crossfire that was started by his own side, firing from behind him, replaced an image that symbolized the deliberate murder of a million and a half children. And despite the staggering disorientation involved in such a moral judgment, Ney spoke for many, including international answers, Ramsey Clark, and this image with the, the, the barbed wire is from uh, international answer. No single incident, no single symbol more aptly identifies the folly of Europeans than this icon of hatred. Even as they repeatedly wave this get out of Holocaust guilt-free card in front of their target TV audiences, namely other Frenchmen, French infidels, um, they unwittingly wave the flag of jihad before the eyes of their restive Muslim immigrant population. Within years, their streets were filled with rioters who firebombed churches, synagogues, cars by the thousands yelling Allah Akbar, and their prisons filled with jihadis whose first call to arms came when they saw images of Muslim suffering run on Western TV. I had a cab driver from Tunisia who said, I grew up in Tunisia, we lived next to the Jews, we got along with them fine. I only became an anti-Semite when I uh, moved to France. I said, why are you watching, you know, some, some uh, Arab uh, station? He said, no, France too. By this last summer, 
cries of outrage at the tsunami of images of Palestinian suffering that journalists unleashed on the Western public sphere became increasingly bold and barely restrained deeds, attacks on synagogues, Jews, Jewish stores. Europeans, both politicians and journalists, wrung their hands at the level of hostility that threatened to chase Jews from Europe. Some even began to glimpse the tragic truth that if this Jewish, that this Jewish exodus threatened European civilization. I personally believe it's the first step in the conquest of Europe. How often in history have nations energetically diffused the war propaganda of their deadliest enemies much less warmly embrace that propaganda? How often have civilizations adopted an apocalyptic narrative that targets them? Allow me to conclude with a consideration of one of the greatest contributors to the ability of the jihadis to enlist the progressive left in their ranks, one that permits the false consciousness of good intentions, this is for peace, to operate far longer than it should among people who unintentionally but consistently contribute to a war that targets them. In leadership positions, both in the BDS movement and supporting it from without, there are a host of Jewish progressives who want to show their commitment to world redemption, aka tikkun olam, by accepting the lethal narratives about Israel and thus proving their bona fides. Scholars have extensively chronicled this old and disturbing phenomenon of Jewish Jew hatred that goes back at least a millennium. In the wake of Aldura, for example, a new contingent of such Jews cropped up, many of them previously invisible Jews, who all of a sudden felt they must, as a Jew, denounce the heinous crimes of the Israelis. These alter juif, as the French critics call them, dominated the public discussion in the aughts. In Julius, Anthony Julius's apt phrase, they are proud to be ashamed to be a Jew. <laughs> Anyone who had the slightest whiff of communitarism, that is partisanship for the Israeli side, got sidelined, Israeli firsters need not apply. This is a messianic syndrome, a kind of masochistic omnipotence fantasy in which since everything is our, the Jews' fault, if only we could change, we could fix everything. It invokes the prophetic tradition to insist on moral perfectionism, even though the prophets did not write their scathing and rhetorically inflated uh, attacks on Jews for a non-Jewish audience, which is what they do. It is not enough for these Jewish critics that Israel matches or surpasses every marker of the most advanced armies for respect for enemy civilian lives, for civic and human rights to, the pop to populations in wartime, for tolerance of criticism during existential crises. No, Israel must live up to its own exalted standards and anything short of that standard deserves loud public denunciations of the most heated and uncompromising rhetoric. We end up with a postmodern moral inversion. If the tribal attitude is my side right or wrong, which is pervasive in the Arab and Muslim world, and the civil attitude is whoever's right my side or not, then the postmodern position has become their side right or wrong. Some Jews have become leaders in the poisonous marriage of pre-modern sadism. You, the imperialist racist whites, are evil and we must kill you. And postmodern masochism, you're right, we deserve it. Of all the Western answers to the jihadi prayer for allies, none has proven so valuable as Jewish anti-Zionism. They've given legitimacy to this lethal narrative even as they attack those who resist them. The Jewish academics and public intellectuals who have consistently and loudly denounced Israel, who are suddenly alarmed at the hostility on campus or uh, to not just Zionism, but to Jews, or like the director of the BBC, Danny Cohen, who is worried about the future of the Jews in Europe, need to ask themselves how much they, in ignoring the forces at work, in dismissing their critics as right-wing fanatics and Israel firsters, actually fueled the apocalyptic hostility, that vision of Israel as the global antichrist. But leave those crazy Jews aside. Why on earth would sound non-Jewish minds want to take such, a tr such troubled advocates as guides to either morality or empirical reality? 
On the, on the contrary, I'd argue, the only way for the democratic, multicultural, tolerant, self-critical, progressive West to survive the jihadi attack is to resist those juicy moral, morsels of moral schadenfreude about Jews behaving badly. It just tastes so good to be able to say, oh, you Jews. And the unconscious racism of moral expectations involved, even especially when offered up by Jews all the more reason to resist the temptation when the lethal narratives are not only inaccurate, but wrapped up as descriptions of an apocalyptic evil. Ironically, to save itself, the West must genuinely renounce its long romance with Jew hatred, which right now constitutes its greatest single vulnerability. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Amazing. Good, good paper. Thank you. So we can open up uh, for comments and uh, criticism, questions. Feel free. Feel free to give me a hard time. <laughs> um, I'm used to it. <laughs> so I, I have a, I'll just give you a brief question. Mm -hmm. So I started off by mentioning that here we are on the eve of a, apparently a bad deal. Right. Um, Eve of a bad deal with Iran. Potentially. That's, that's, that's the rumor. Um, and the fact that anti-Semitism is the elephant in the room, but it, as Potterot said, it's, it's the hatred that, that we dare not speak its name. Right. We don't speak about it, but this is the elephant in the room. Can you comment on the impact, the silence on issues of anti-Semitism and human rights vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian revolutionary regime, which openly and consistently calls not just for the destruction of Israel, but for the annihilation of every living Jew. So, um, more broadly, one of the things that I would say is that, um, you know, again, the Aldura affair really had an electric effect on Europe. Um, if you look at a book like, uh, the first book to come out on the new anti-Semitism, a year before Phyllis's book came out, which is uh, um, Pierre-André Taguieff's book, which has been translated into English called uh, Rising from the Muck. Um, if you look at it, October 2000 is this jump, massive jump in attack on Jews, both verbal in the schools and stuff, yeah, where uh, the French slang word for a Jew is feuge. So if you say stambique feuge, it's a, it's, a, it's a Jewish pen, it means it doesn't work. It's, a, it's like a, a, a word of denigration. And this spread through the schools. There's a, a book came out the same year, 2002, called The Lost Territories of the Republic. One of the striking things about this sudden emergence of really nasty anti-Semitism was the utter denial of French officials and French journalists about this. For instance, I told you about this incident at uh, uh, Place de la République where they're shouting death to Jews for the first time since the Holocaust in a European capital, a crowd, a mob is shouting this. The journalists didn't mention it. It only came out later in long stories. It's a, there's a, a, an article, Francis Scarlet Letter, which came out in Vanity Fair in 2003, which quoted people who had been there, but at the time, nobody heard about this. So you have this situation where the denial of anti-Semitism is, the, the, I, I don't even, I mean, I, I'm a medievalist. We, we try and use our words carefully. So anti-Semitism, I save for delirious exterminationist beliefs that Jews are going to destroy us and we must destroy them before they destroy us. That's what the Nazis believe. That's what the jihadis believe. That's anti-Semitism. It's Jew hatred or, or anti-Judaism or, you know, whatever, Judeophobia. There, there, are, there are mild versions of this that uh, I, I think it's important to distinguish and not call everything anti-Semitism. But so this was both, there was anti-Semitic sentiment, but there was also widespread dis expressions of dislike for Jews to the point where, and this a number of non-Jews told me that this had happened to them at dinner parties, the, the dumping on Israel was so pervasive that if anybody defended Israel, the immediate response was, oh, I didn't know you were Jewish. 
And, and in 2006, actually, I was on the board of the AJC at the time, uh, the Consul General of, from France of Boston spoke to us, and he was Jewish. And afterwards, I went up to him and I said, you know, I understand that, uh, you know, in, Israel, in France today, you can't defend Israel without being told, uh, I didn't know you were Jewish. Uh, and he said, well, yeah, because, you know, who but a Jew would defend Israel at this point? So, in other words, the, the sort of wave of distaste for Jews and the wave, I call it, uh, this insatiable appetite for moral schadenfreude. In other words, this insatiable appetite for stories that enable Gentiles, particularly progressive left, to look down on the Jews and say, you Jews, you know, 2,000 years you were oppressed and now you turn around and do it to the Palestinians. Somehow that makes them feel good. Um, my my father, Zal, used to say, um, uh, you don't make yourself look bigger by making other people look smaller. But Europeans are addicted to making themselves look bigger by making Israel and the Jews look smaller. In any case, uh, to get back to Iran, Iran is a perfect example of this. You know, you have people who basically look at Iran, completely blank out the anti-Semitic discourse because they don't want to deal with it. And as a result, you get this whitewash of Iran in which, apparently, the, this is the most convincing argument I've read for President Obama's, what strikes me as uh, really um, disastrous behavior, is he actually thinks that Iran will be a sort of pillar of stability in the Middle East. You know, it's like breathtaking. It, it is literally what Chamberlain thought he was doing with, with the Nazis, that you know this was peace in our time. Um, and I think that the ability to blank out the Jewish thing, on the one hand, permits people to do really foolish things, and on the other hand, gives wings to the anti-Semitism. So it's disastrous. Shimon. Here's something I've been trying to understand. Um, according to a recent survey, anti-Semitic attacks in the U.S. itself were uh -huh. up 20% right. over the last year. And yet, and yet, there is no comparison between the situation here and the situation in Europe. And you go to a synagogue here, and you don't see the barbed wire, you don't see the police cars, you don't see... Right. What is it about the U.S. that anti-Semitism has... Less of a grip. It's, right. it's, not been, it's not been 17 years, but since 70 right. years since uh, Ford was distributing right. Semitic material. Right. What is it about the So, that okay, so uh, that's a lovely question. Uh, and finally, something I get to say, so, some nice things. Um, first of all, I think that the lack of real uh, um, traction for anti Jewish uh, sentiments and rhetoric in the United States is a reflection of American exceptionalism. Um, in Europe, if you want to be a Jew, you better hide the fact that you're a Jew. You don't, you don't, you know, if you want to make it, it, you know, the guy who's now the head of the BBC, uh, Mr. Cohen, is not walking around with a kippah, and in fact, you know, aside from the fact that he's got this Jewish last name, uh, there's nothing about him that indicates that he's Jewish. In America, it's possible to be a Jew in academia, in, you know, prominent places, and not necessarily get uh, stigmatized as a result. So America is a culture vastly more tolerant than Europe is. Uh, and not just when it comes to Jews, when it comes to all kinds of different minorities and so on. Uh, that's the first point I make. You know, uh, Ford passed out the protocols. Um, Father Coughlin, uh, the interesting thing about Father Coughlin's career is it actually crashed when he started to get anti-Semitic. So I, you know, I think, first of all, I think that right at its origins, America identified itself with the, the Jewish people, they thought they were the new chosen people and so on. Normally that leads to, as it did in Europe, to a kind of competition. And the ultimate thing about the Nazis is they really thought they were the chosen people and they were killing their, their rivals. Whereas Americans have had a remarkably positive sum attitude towards their sense of chosenness, which makes them vastly more capable of tolerating uh, Jews who are not 
in a state of subjection and humiliation, which is what dominated the European scene and the Christian scene and still dominates the Muslim scene for a millennium and a half of its history. So America is really an exceptional place. It's a, you know, it's a real blessing. Yes? But, um, isn't it true that, let's say, in the last five, six years, um, Things have gotten worse? Yes. Absolutely. It's it's the, not only have things gotten... Okay right. right. Not only have things gotten worse, but in particular, they've gotten worse on campuses. Oh. Um, well, and... Yes, no, I mean, in, in my reading, because after the Holocaust, anti-Semitism is no longer politically correct, uh, anti, well, Jew hatred mutates. And the mutation is anti-Zionism. Uh, and this idea that, you know, I'm just against Israel, I'm not against the Jews, you're against, sover you're against Jews having sovereignty. You're not against Poles having sovereignty, you're not against anybody else having sovereignty, but you're against Jews having sovereignty. So I think it's nonsense to argue that anti-Zionism doesn't carry this component and doesn't serve as a particularly effective mask. Um, the real problem in academia, it seems to me, and it, all right, so this is, this is my theory of what I call uh, the, supersession, the secular supersessionism of the progressive left, which is uh, supersessionism is this belief that both Christians and Muslims developed, which is we are the chosen people, and it's a zero-sum game. In order for us to be chosen, the Jews have to be unchosen. For the Muslims, the Jews and the Christians have to be unchosen. Right? So you have this system whereby we are up because they are down. We are chosen because they've been unchosen. Um, and now I think you have it in the secular progressive left. That is to say, you, the secular progressive, the, the, the global progressive left believes that they are the cutting edge of morality in the globe today. They represent the true path for humanity and they're they need, for, for reasons that betray, it seems to me, deep insecurity, they need to put Jews down. Um, you know, for the global progressive left, Israel's right wing, it's imperialist, it's colonialist, it's racist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The fact is that, A, Israel is a leftist progressive movement. Uh, it was founded by secular progressive leftists. And it's got the best record in the history of the left of what they've done with power when they got it. When the Russians got power, when the French revolutionaries got power, when the communist Chinese got power, when, they, when the, the Cuban communists got power, every time the left got power and was threatened, they went totalitarian. They turned not only on their enemies, but they turned on their internal dissent. Israel's record of now, what is it, 67 years? of democracy under conditions that would have driven any other leftist movement to totalitarianism represents a record that puts Joe DiMaggio's 56 straight games in the shade. So that would be my take. Yeah. In this regard of the leftist progressive, I would like to know what you think about Ari Shavit, the promised land, the chapter in which he compares right. the young Israelis with Nazis. Did we need that? No, he didn't need it. He didn't need it. I mean, look, one of the things that Jews... Uh, uh, Did they need this? I, I think that self-criticism is one of the greatest strengths that the Jewish people have. The ability to sort of take a step back and say, you know, maybe I did something wrong here or whatever. It's, it's built into the biblical yeah. narrative, you know. The, the descriptions of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not exactly heroic and flattering uh, from, a, from a, the point of view of sort of, you know, macho man, uh, macho man stuff. You know, you got three founding fathers, only one of whom may have killed somebody and we don't even know, right? I mean, what, what tradition has founding fathers who don't kill a lot of people. So um, self-criticism, I think, is, is basic to Judaism. But what's happened now is that the, the progressives believe that they show that they're good Jews by not being tribal, by not defending their own people. What kills me about that is absolutely it's important to be able to self-criticize when it's appropriate. My side, not my side right or wrong, but whoever's right, my side or not. 
What's happened to the progressives is that they've gotten to the point where, it, you know, like runners get addicted to running, self-critics get addicted to self-criticism, and, and they can't stop. So if they read something in the newspaper that says that Israelis did X, they won't say, wait a minute, is it possible the newspaper got it wrong? They'll say, oh my God, once again, we look terrible in the eyes. And I'm about to put up a post on this. I actually think that this is a form of uh, proxy self. I mean, groups like J Street is now becoming more and more, it's becoming more and more clear, including this latest speech by Marsha Friedman, um, the degree to which they will countenance literally the disassembling of the state of Israel uh, and Jewish sovereignty. But um, even more groups like Jewish Voice for Peace and stuff, we're dealing here with people who I think are engaged in a kind of honor killing. Phyllis is a big specialist on this, right? So I have to tread carefully here. But essentially what happens in an honor killing is a mem member of your family has done something that has so shamed you in the eyes of your honor group that you feel the pressure to get rid of that member of the family. And I think that for progressive Jews, it's not what Israel's done, it's the way Israel is depicted in the media that is utterly shameful. I mean, anybody who, you know, feels, you know, likes progressive values, I'm one of them. You know, you look at the way Israel's pro projected as this vicious Goliath and you go, oh my God, this is horrible. Right? And then you say, but I'm going to prove what a good person I am by criticizing my own people. Which is, okay, criticize your own people. Do it to your own people. But when you go out in front of Gentiles and say, I'm a good Jew. As a Jew, I must denounce the terrible things that my people are doing. Then I think that you've crossed the line. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, it seems to me one positive thing I was searching <laughs> you know, there's got to be something good. It seems to me one group that's wonderfully resistant to the, to the narrative we portray right. is the evangelical Christian community. Uh huh. In the so far. Right. right. Irrespective of their ulterior motives. You got to read Dexter Van Zyl on this, but yeah. Right. Right. Right now, they right. seem to be right. even, even better than Jews. Mm. In Israel, in the resistance to right. this narrative, right. unashamedly so. Right. So the question is is there. Is there the possibility of an embryonic antidote to the narrative with learning from them and their resistance? Yeah. To I'll tell you, I mean, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, the first thing I'd say is, by and large, I get uncomfortable around evangelicals, partly because I know the apocalyptic narrative on which their support for Israel is based. And a lot of people say, well, I don't, we, don't, we don't care, you know, if, if they're waiting for Jesus to return, then, you know, we'll, as long as they support us until then, fine. But as a student of millennial expectations, I'm painfully aware that the really nasty stuff, stuff comes when you're disappointed. So that uh, disappointment uh, in the lack of Jesus coming back creates a problem, okay. Um, but in general, I'm uncomfortable with people who more or less on faith side. I mean, I like people who think that if you bless Jews, you will be blessed. I think that, in fact, we're a positive some people, and if you treat us in positive some ways, everybody wins. Um, if you treat us in negative some ways, everybody loses, uh, which is the story of the Arab world in the 20th century and the story of the Spanish world in the 16th century. Um, however, I really think that the, 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 the work that needs to be done to turn this around has to be done on the left. The left has done unbelievable damage. They've behaved with a stupidity that is literally breathtaking. And as a result, they have not only hurt Israel enormously, they've made life miserable for the Palestinian people. No people have had more support and suffered more for it than the Palestinian people getting the support of the left, who instead of actually supporting the Palestinian people, have supported the leadership that systematically sacrifices them 
in their battle against Israel, in their crazy battle to regain their lost honor from Israel. So I think that if, if something's going to happen here, it has to happen on the left. It's not going to, I mean, you know, thank God for the evangelicals, um, at least so far. There's evidence that the younger generation is not uh, going to stay in this particular path. Again, read the work of Dexter Van Zyl from camera. Uh, but I think it's the left that needs to do tshuva. How do you begin to change? How do you reach them? How do you reach them? Well, so one of the things that I think you can do, I mean, I think one key message is what I tried to get at in this paper, which is to think about the ways in which they are adopt, they've been duped into adopting a narrative that targets them. What the Europeans, you know, basically in the history of Christianity, Jew baiting has been a freebie. You know, you, you, you bait Jews, you make fun of them, you mock them, you knock them down, you this, you that, and they just sort of, you know, like Freud's father, they pick up their hat and they walk away, um, and they don't fight back, right? But now, Jew baiting is empowering jihadi Muslims who are targeting the very people who think that, you know, they're such good people because they're embracing this exotic form of, of, uh, of Islam. I mean, I've had Europeans say to me, well, at least in Europe we have authentic Islam. They kill their daughters. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, you know, so th this is like crazy stuff. Huh? So, um, so I think one thing is, I don't think that you get very far appealing to people, and Charles, this is uh, some conversation we can hold someday. I don't think you get very far, certainly with Europeans, saying you shouldn't do this because it's anti-Semitic. It, it, it's not going to carry any weight. If you say you shouldn't do this because you're slitting your own throat, then I think you might get some traction. So I think that that's one place. And the other place, it seems to me, is just to really have them rethink this idea that, you know, in, in adopting this, this antichrist narrative, this, the, the, the um, Muslim Arab term is Dajjal, that's their term for the antichrist. Uh, the apocalyptic enemy, and adopting Israel as the apocalyptic enemy, there, it's, it's a complete win for the other side because Israel represents far and away the most progressive force in the Middle East, and I would argue one of, if not the most progressive force in the world today. I mean, if I, I live in Israel. You know, the hospitals are amazing. The, the, the social work, the creativity, the, the stuff that goes on in Israel, the volunteer work, the stuff that goes on in Israel is breathtaking in its progressive. Now, there's other stuff as well, granted, but there's other stuff everywhere in the world. So to, to attack Israel, this progressive bastion, is insanely self-destructive for progressives to do. And the question is, how do you get them out of it? And I, I got to say, the, the, the sort of the French word is acharnement, the, 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 the determination. You know, they're like bulldogs. They've dug their teeth into this and they won't let it go. And particularly in academia, you know, how do you tell really smart people they're being really stupid? Yeah. Um, you and I understand that I'm uh, always the nihilist in the room. Right. Uh, what? Not everybody else. He's yeah. the nihilist in the room. In the room, but it seems to me that there are no arguments that are going to change the left. What will eventually change the left is when the jihadis do something so outrageous, and hopefully, hopefully it's not a new, that, that nobody will any longer. They haven't done it already? Yeah, they, they yeah, like ISIS? Yeah. So look, ISIS, ISIS has actually changed something of the calculation. And I've got to say, when ISIS first sort of hit the scene, and those of us who pay attention to apocalyptic were aware of their apocalyptic nature, uh, we decided on this conference. So that was about a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, since then, you know, Gra those of you who haven't read Graham Wood's article in the Atlantic Monthly, 10,000 words on apocalyptic uh, jihad, 
um, you owe it to yourself to read it. I think that could be, that discourse could be something of a game changer. But really, I think it has to be, you're not going to change the minds. You know, this is the point that uh, Thomas Kuhn makes in uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which is a paradigm shift does not come by convincing the old guard to change their minds. It comes from the new generation. And I, I think that that's true of journalists. I think that that Israel needs to start producing curricula for training journalists to do cognitive, to do to do journalism in an asymmetric war zone where the enemy, where the, 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 the weak side, has no inhibitions about intimidating and killing journalists, kidnapping them, threatening them, torturing them, etc. Uh, and the strong side has all kinds of democratic inhibitions about doing it. And, you know, those are, those are very important things to deal with. And most of the journalists who come don't have a clue about what they're about to get into. And they get there, and then they get socialized by the older generation of journalists who explain to them, look, as long as you tell the, the Hamas narrative, you're not in danger from Hamas, and you can say anything you want about Israel because they're not going to put you in danger. So, you know, it's only if you get hit by uh, a bomb uh, by accident that you're in danger. And hey, this gets back to this thing about the, 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 the insatiable appetite for stories about Jews behaving badly. There was a German photographer who was in Syria risking his life and he couldn't sell his pictures. But when he went to Gaza and moved into a five-star hotel, everybody wanted his pictures, you know, because nobody wants to see pictures of Arabs who were killed by Arabs. They want to see pictures of Arabs who were killed by Jews. So you got to get to, I th to get back to your point, I think you have to start with the next generation, those are the people you have to reach. And I think that things have gotten so absurd now, like this latest incident at, uh, at uh, Connecticut College. Um, things have gotten so absurd. Um, the, the sort of concern about microaggression. Connecticut College is a very popular, very liberal professor. It was funny because he, he, was, he was protesting his liberalness. He said, I'm for the two-state solution. Um, uh, by the way, on the subject of the two-state solution, I'm a member of Peace Win. Um, Peace Win. Peace Win. Yeah. Um, so uh, he wrote. He said, you know, a political cartoonist could do a thing about, you know, um, this was during the war this last summer about uh, a pit bull, by which he meant Hamas, and he sort of elaborated this. So it gets, he gets assaulted for dehumanizing the Palestinians and, and literally at this point he's taken a medical leave uh, because he was just so brutalized by these assaults. And this was all on the basis of a, a group of people who were students for justice in Palestine, which is one of the biggest hate groups out there, you know, who uh, support groups like Hamas, who regularly refer to Jews as the sons of uh, monkeys and pigs. Um, so this hate group managed to make this professor a hate speaker who should be banned and the rest of the campus, and particularly the, the, the professors, and one of them is a very close friend of mine, basically got sort of roped into this. So, um, you know, and, and all of this is sort of, you know, the underrepresented students are made to feel uncomfortable by things like this, okay? So you get this scene where, you know, anything that makes jihadis feel uncomfortable, like criticism of Islam, is automatically... Uh, banned as uh, inappropriate speech. And I really think we have to tackle this problem of, you know, hurt feelings. Nobody, nobody's concerned about the hurt feelings of Jews, right? Nobody, nobody cares. So you say all sorts of things about Israel, and if it hurts your feelings, tough noogies. But you say things about Islam, and it hurts the feelings of Muslims. Oh, no, you can't do that. And the Jewish professors just intimidate? Yes, yes. If not one over, I mean, look, I, this is a theory I developed in terms of journalists, but I, I think it works for professors as well. And that is that, that the real motivation behind the sort of pro 
Palestinian stance is intimidation. You, if you don't tell the story of the Israeli Goliath and the Palestinian David, you're in trouble. At best, you're not allowed back in. At worst, you know, serious things could happen to you. And so, in order to deal with, in order to deal with the cowardice of acceding to this intimidation, journalists adopt this advocacy posture. I'm for the little guy, I'm for the underdog, and so on and so forth. And I think in general, there's this, you know, there's a book called Underdogma, which is about, you know, the sort of insane pursuit of supporting the underdog, no matter how vicious he is. Well, it turns out, I think, it's not that they, people support the underdog, no matter how vicious he is. They support the underdog because he's vicious and they're afraid of him. And then they hide behind this moral... Are we running out? Go ahead. Um, I would argue that Palestinians have a right to uh, self-determination and to live with two-state solutions side by side with uh, Israel. Right. And there was a period, so I don't know if this is a, just simply a generational thing. Right. There was a period, I would argue, where it seemed that the nationalists had control over Palestinian society, and there was an attempt with Camp David, uh, with Oslo, right. with Madrid, to try to create some sort of accommodation. It fell apart clearly. Right. But the, to me, the thing that shifted dramatically is the rise of radical political Islam, which is unseated. It's taking over societies, it's taking over institutions, the mass, right. uh, it's threatening Fatah right. in a very serious way. The Muslim Brotherhood, which is being supported by right. Western countries, including the United right. States, is, is descending into right. war. So this shift, I think, in a sense, has gone unnoticed because the Islamists can't recognize the self-determination of the other. So is it just so, so is it something that's been missed, or is it just sort of you know? Look, I I don't want to burst your bubble, <laughs> but. Um, Anybody paying attention in the 1990s, and I was in Israel in 94, 95 uh, on sabbatical and uh, subsequently went back a number of times in the 90s um, and was involved in a, uh, through Yedidya congregation, a dialogue with Palestinians and so on and so forth. Um, the evidence is overwhelming, not in terms of the Palestinian people as a whole, but in terms of the PLO. I don't think there was ever any intention of making peace. From the beginning, it was an Oz, it was, what, what do they call it, the Trojan horse. Um, Arafat gave that speech in South Africa, and Dan Pipes was blisteringly attacked as an Islamophobe for pointing out what he was talking about when he talked about the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and so on. So, I, you know, and if you talk, I mean, I'm sure Itamar Marcus has spoken here before. Uh, he did a piece about Palestinian TV in the summer of 2000, which is when Camp David was happening and everybody was hopeful, you know, and the people who believed it said, we were that close, we were that close. They were showing fake scenes of Israelis raping Palestinians. They were preparing for war. And one of the things that happened during Oslo was you had Israeli journalists pursuing what was what is still called peace journalism, which is downplaying the bad things the enemy does and upplaying all the things that we should trust them on and the good, the good and the promising stuff. And the Palestinians were pursuing war journalism. And guess who loses? It's the same thing as when the left pursues, you know, the, the global antichrist of Israel and American colonialism. Uh, they're the ones who lose. Progressive values are the things that lose. So I don't see, for, I don't think that what we mean by secular exists in the Arab world. It's non-observant, you know? They wear jeans, they don't, or they didn't used to uh, fast on Ramadan and so on and so forth, but they were still utterly committed to the honor paradigm that said Israel has robbed us of our honor by their very existence and we must obliterate them one way or another. And the big difference between Fatah and Hamas is that Fatah is willing to do it in two stages and Hamas won't, you know, is too proud to, you know, make the compromises necessary for a middle stage. Um, so I don't think that was the case, but I do think that part of the problem was that repeatedly people said, you gotta trust Arafat, you gotta trust Arafat, you gotta trust Arafat, you have to make him stronger. That was disastrous. 
I think there are forces in Palestinian society that want peace. We just haven't empowered them. You mean like J Street? Like, no, 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 no. Within the university system, uh -huh. in America, you know, in America, as I see it, it's not just the campus, it's demonstrations on the street, it's certainly the media, it's everything emanating from all human rights groups and the United Nations that make me feel increasingly surrounded. The kind of security we kind of go through to get up here, Richard had to come and help me get in is what we're living in in America, so that we're all Israelis and increasingly becoming security conscious by necessity. But, but my point is we don't have access to the old guard or to the younger generations of journalists or of uh, intellectuals because they won't listen to us. Somebody approached me very recently to join him in a panel on anti-Semitism on the left at a major left conference. Right. And I said, I'm duty-bound to join you. But they decided ultimately not to. Not to. Because the left people said, well, we need to have diversity on the panel. Right. And, and diversity means, means said, inviting students, students for justice in Palestine. Right. He, who knows if they would have come right. up with But we don't have the access, which is right. to the coming generations of which you speak. Right. At least not yet. At least not yet. And Maybe ISCAP can gain that. Right. I mean, I, you know, Open Hillel is a really good example of this because it's open from the center to the far left. Anything on the other side is completely shut out. And I was supposed to speak at Brown Hillel. On, I just published two articles in Mary Barry Rubin's publication on the Goldstone Report. And there's going to be a panel on the Goldstone Report. And I was supposed to speak. And I spoke with the woman who was, to, you know, and she described to me who else was in the panel. And I was clearly the outlier right wing it. And I said, you know, if you really want to balance it, maybe you should get somebody, to, uh, you know, who's even harder liner than I am. I got this invited. And I wasn't even told. I called up to say, when should I be there? She said, oh, I'm sorry, you're not participating. Yeah, this is right. the story. Right. I mean, it's like, it's like Dershowitz trying to go to J Street. You know, they, they will invite the most unbelievable speakers who are anti-Israel and they won't invite a pro-Israel speaker. Or they'll subject you to the gauntlet you have to run for And it may be a blessing because by the only time at American University I, I was escorted by two police cruisers off campus and taken to a highway from Brown University. <laughs> Brown University. Because there was a crowd trying to... Uh, Lynch you. Yeah. Oh my God. Ramallah Lynch. Lynch. What, um, you. How should the organized Jewish community be responding to... Um, Oh, the policy of the Obama administration? Look, I personally, I think Obama is beyond reach. Forget it. I, I, Obama, yes. Now, the only people who can get to Obama, and I saw recently that he caucused with the, or he met with some Jewish uh, congressmen to get their support for Iran, and they said, look, you know, you got to cut the, the vicious rhetoric about Israel, or we can't, get, we, we, you know, we can't help you. So now, apparently, he's going to tone down the rhetoric. But I think that the thing to do is go through, and particularly to pressure Democratic uh, uh, congressmen like Chuck Schumer, who is my classmate, um, uh, Pressure them to to rein in this madness, um, which is I mean I'm my favorite uh, hashtag right now on Twitter is uh, uh, hashtag Poutus uh, instead of Potus because it's like you know this guy's a, a child he's behaving like a child. So we're over time, so we'll take a couple of quick questions. All right. So Robert and you. And you, Phil three, has three, mentioned, please be short. Three, uh, three yeah. quick questions, and then Phil has mentioned the security she had to go through downstairs. I've spent 30 years in immigration law, 11 years as an officer in inspections at Kennedy Airport, uh -huh. practicing law. Right. The disaster we see in Europe, it's I believe because Arabia is spilling into Europe, 
what, 1,000 or 2,000 per day? What's the question? Yeah. The, it's a statement of, uh, of the, the left will change when ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all of them are battling for control of Europe, and the left is sitting on its hands watching their whole civilization disappear. All right, so uh, well, I would say, to, oh, okay. you want me to answer? Yeah, let me quickly answer that. I think <laughs> that our job is to assist encourage and possibly precipitate the waking up that will take place so that a it takes place sooner rather than later and b it doesn't take place in terms of a panic response that leads to a sort of counter fascism and that's why i think that the progressive left really needs to step in here there's a breach to be stepped into and it's the and it's People who think decently, who need to step into that breach instead of behaving like a bunch of, you know. Yeah. What? Two, no, hold on. Two quick, two quick questions. I'm going to collect them quickly, please. Okay. Why does Israel have such lousy public relations? Why do you have to leave it up to American groups like Camera or others to question editorial? Okay. Hold so, on. Hold on. Second question. God believe that the problem, as you say, is from the left. You can't change the jihadis, but the left has to be made to change, starting in Israel. And oh. in Israel, and that is only going to happen, that is only going to happen when there becomes a strong right. sense of identity and purpose. Yeah. And I'll tell you. Right-wing nationalism. Quick anecdote. Um, in 1982, my wife was teaching at Boston, at uh, Berkeley, and I was writing my thesis, and the war in Lebanon broke out. And I l lost about a year on my thesis because every day from about 11 to 3, I was in Sproul Plaza arguing with people. And one day I'm arguing with this guy, and he's, there's something about him. Uh, you know, f he's arguing vociferously against Israel, but there's something about him. I finally said, are you Israeli? <laughs> and he said, how did you know? I said, well, there was something about your arrogance that gave you away. <laughs> it turned out he was Moshe Aaron's son, <laughs> who's was famous here, for being, there. but he was here, not there. But the point is that, look, you know, Israeli leftists, they are mashu. Um, I, I don't think that you should set your path to global redemption via the conversion of Israeli leftists. But on the other hand, look, you know, a lot of Israeli leftists are, are complaining now, nobody listens to us, you know, or, um, and, and rightfully nobody's listening to them because they're just not, anyway. Um, wait, wait, somebody, there was another question, okay, go ahead. Why does Israel have such lousy PR? Oh, lousy, right, 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 okay. Why does Israel have such lousy PR? So, first of all, I think, you know, historically and for good reason, Israeli attitudes were, you know, um shmum, uh, we don't do that crap, we fight wars, right? And it matters who wins on the battlefield and hell with what happens, and then that was, made worse by Shimon Peres, who decided with the beginning of the Oslo process that we don't need a Ministry of Information Hasbara because a good foreign policy is all you need. We see the shipwreck of that now because, you know, there's no foreign policy that Israel can conduct that's going to please the West uh, unless it makes concessions to people who will use them to eat, eat Israel up. So. So there's a really serious problem. The second problem is Israelis really don't know about anti-Semitism. Israel was founded on the belief that with Israel, anti-Semitism will be gone. And most Israelis were raised with the belief that anti-Semitism was a thing of the past. And you have to listen to um, uh, Yossi Klein Halevi, who I came yeah. to, to Yale to hear at, an is, at a Yisa talk, who said, you know, up until 2000, I thought that anti-Semitism was gone, and then all of a sudden I had to realize it was back. Mm -hmm. So I think that for all those reasons, plus the fact that basically Israel can be as good as it wants, the world is so eager to hear bad stories about Jews that, you know, I, I talked to a woman in France who was with the embassy and trying to deal with this, and she said, look, you know, no matter how good we are, it's not going to work. Now, um, I think that things are changing. Personally, I think that Israel can play an absolutely critical role in changing 
world attitudes, not just towards Israel, but towards the whole issue of jihad, because the fact is Israel is fighting. It's one of the main fronts of the jihad. France is another main front of the jihad. And America is relatively protected so far from the jihad. So I think that, that by and large, Israel can play a key role in showing the rest of the world how to confront jihad, but they have to confront it on the cognitive field. And that's why I'm going, to, I can't wait to get out of BU and go to Israel and work full time on the Thank cognitive you. war. Okay, okay so, well, hold on. I'm, I'm a BU alumni. Uh, cool. okay. <laughs> I have some of my best friends are from BU. <laughs> <laughs> I just, before I thank Richard, tomorrow evening at 5.30, we have Gunter Jekeli. Gunter is a German scholar who just did a very important study on Muslim youth, Muslim youth perceptions of mm. Jews. Oh, wow. And he also runs uh, ISGAP at the Serbon. And he's a young uh, sociologist doing very good work. He'll be here tomorrow at 5.30. Okay. You're all welcome. And on behalf of uh, ISGAP, Richard, thank you very much for all your work. Thank you. All the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. John Lennon, 1971. And now, imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Something to kill and die for. And one religion, too. Imagine all the people living under our peace. You may say we're dreamers, but we're not the only ones say this is Jihadi John. Welcome to the 21st century. Despite the spectacular attacks on the West, 9-11 being the most prominent, most Westerners have little familiarity with the Jihadi narrative, a narrative first revealed in Khomeini's Iran in 1979. It varies significantly, it's an apocalyptic narrative that varies significantly in some ways from traditional Muslim apocalyptic thought, which focused on a last judgment at the end of time. That's how Muhammad started his career, by announcing that uh, judgment day was coming. And really, during the early Medina period, uh, he, his feeling was that as long as you believed in one God and the coming judgment, it didn't matter what religion you were, Jewish, Christian. This was when they were still praying towards Jerusalem. Instead, this current apocalyptic scenario focuses on a this-worldly messianic era envisioned as the global victory of Islam, when all of Dar al-Harb becomes Dar al-Islam. How many people here know Dar al-Harb, Dar al-Islam? Okay, all right, so uh, alas, we're now 15, into our 15th year since 9-11. Uh, and these are basic concepts that's, that everybody should have found out about immediately, but uh, we were really disinformed. I gave a talk to 400 people from Homeland Security and approximately the same percent knew. Dar al-Islam is the realm of Islam or submission. It's where Sharia law rules. It's majority Muslim countries in which the Sharia is the law of the land. And Dar al-Harb is, uh, Harb is the Arabic word for kherev, uh, the sword. It's the realm of the sword. It's the realm of war. It's the realm that needs to be conquered. And essentially, in jihadi, uh, to, to sort of give a Freudian version of the jihadi formula, where there was Dar al-Harb, there shall be Dar al-Islam. And all of us, welcome you all, are harbies. That is, we are destined to the sword. Richard's been working on these issues for a long time. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an honor that you're here. Thank you for coming. And I will just interject my two cents worth on the on the eve of uh, the Iran negotiations where anti-semitism and human rights are being stifled intentionally stifled the the impact of this on anti-semitism is is deep and serious and it's not just a problem of Israel coming from this conference we see the the silencing of issues of anti-Semitism globally really having an impact on communities. There are, there are communities in South America and in Europe that are under siege. 
And we have to remember that this bubble of the United States and this bubble of New York is not the global reality. So we have to be aware of what's happening. There's a lot of communities facing really serious uh, issues. So Professor Landis is a professor of history at Boston University. <coughs> he was trained and did research as a mid middle medievalist. His early work focused on the period of 1000 CE, a moment, in his opinion, of both cultural mutation, origins of the modern West, and an intense apocalyptic and millennial, millennial expectations. His most recent publication uh, is entitled Heaven on Earth, the Varieties of the Millennium Experience, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2011, and the Paranoid Apocalypse, a hundred-year retrospective of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was printed and uh, published by NYU Press in 2011 with Professor Katz, which is a very important uh, book. I highly recommend it. So again, that's called, they're both important, but the Paranoid ap Apocalypse, a hundred years of uh, retrospective on the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which touches very much on the work of ISGAP. It's a very important uh, contribution. In 2005, he launched a media oversight project uh, entitled The Second Draft in order to look at what, he, what, what the news media calls their first draft of history. His opening dossier was Pallywood and the Mohammed al Dura affair, which uh, you'll see in the presentation. Since 2005, uh, Richard has been blogging the new uh, Augrian Stables. In 2009, uh, just after the publication of the Goldstone Report, he and other critics put up a website dedicated to the understanding of the Goldstone Report, which was an important, is an important group still today, even after the uh, Goldstone Apology. He and his so, those who join this movement fight in an apocalyptic battle in which Jews will be slaughtered and the rest of the Harbis will convert, accept the Dhimma contract of submission, or become slaves, or are put to death. A second global Islamic kingdom, only this time really encompassing the whole world, is on its way. In the battle, no mercy can be shown to those who resist Islam's coming dominion. Everything to kill and die for. Suicide martyrs go straight to heaven, their victims straight to hell. Muslim apocalyptic believers hold that the traditional great and small signs of the end, that's a traditional term in Islam, have been fulfilled in our day. The ever-growing power of the godless modern West has grown so great that it threatens Islam with annihilation, with its progressive values of tolerance and equality for all, including women and, God forbid, gays. The West incarnates the rebellion against Allah's will, the triumph of diabolic forces, including that of women mis misbehaving. One of the signs of the end, end in Islamic apocalyptic discourse is when women talk back to their husbands. Um, and who is their apocalyptic enemy in this final war of extermination? The overwhelming, indeed monotonous answer, because there's a wide range of apocalyptic di uh, discourse, both Shiite, Shiite and Sunni, is some combination of U.S. and Israel, the great and the little Satan. It is the sacred task of the jihadis to destroy that enemy in order to redeem the world by the global imposition of Sharia. Now my friend Mark, who just walked in, with whom I discussed this talk, told me I have to have a quote, at least, to illustrate the claim that the jihadi aim is world conquest. I looked at him puzzled. Anyone familiar with the literature knows how pervasive and open that ambition is. They don't, hide their, they don't hide their intentions, we hide our eyes. The very idea that 15 years after 9-11, Westerners still need quotes to prove this is evidence of the problem I'm about to discuss. But just to acknowledge that request, here's a quote, not from Al-Qaeda, not from ISIS, not from the Muslim Brotherhood, all of whom are known for their global ambitions, but from Hamas, considered even by high-ranking Israeli intelligence circles as a national religious movement, not comparable to global movements like ISIS. Here in 2002, at the height of the Intifada, is Sheikh Ibrahim Mahdi speaking about the genocidal apocalyptic hadith whereby Muslims
So thank you very much for coming. I'm going to start off with two announcements about ISGA. Number one, I've been instructed, and I think correctly so, there's envelopes on your, in front of you. And just to let you know, we'd be grateful for any donations. ISGAP is a 501c3, and all the programming we do here in, uh, in this building, and at McGill, at Harvard, at Columbia, in Rome, at Sapienza, and in France, and now we're starting a program in Oxford, we have to raise the funds for everything. So from the coffee to the events and to the scholarship. So any help, or if you know people that would help us, we'd be grateful. Uh, and the second announcement is that I just came back this morning from uh, Santiago, Chile. And on Thursday, we signed an agreement and we're going to start a program. We've started a program at the University of Chile in Santiago. And we're working with really fine scholars and um, a guy named Oscar Kleinkoff, who's an amazing, uh, he's a young entrepreneur and uh, really a dynamic uh, leader. So that went off well. And then we attended, um, actually Oscar organized a conference that was supported by the World Jewish Congress and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Israel. And um, they invited young leaders from 25 to 40 years old from 10 uh, South American countries. So it was a very uh, impressive conference of young, young Jewish leaders dealing with issues of anti-Semitism and how uh, they're coping and dealing with things. So it was very interesting meeting young leaders from uh, Chile and Argentina. Argentina's reeling after the Alberto Nisman assassination and uh, situation in Paraguay, Uruguay, Brazil. It was very, it was fascinating. So it was a good few days. And uh, there's a lot of interest in ISGAP throughout, throughout South America now. So. There may be more programs in the offing. And of course, so here we have, uh, an, we're honored to have Richard Landis with us today. Professor Landis is going to speak about anti-Semitism's fatal attraction, the global perspective, the global progressive left, the jihadist right, and Israel as the 20th, 21st century antichrist. And uh, associates are trying to create the Institute for Cognitive War Research whose first project is to establish the al Dura project. He is currently writing two books, one on the Middle Ages, while, entitled While God Tarried, Disappointed Millennialism from Jesus to the Peace of God, and another book about the current situation, entitled They're So Smart Because We're So Stupid, A Medievalist Guide to the 21st Century of Cog War. I don't, you'll explain what that 21st means. 21st Century Cognitive Warfare. Cognitive Warfare, okay. So, really, Richard, thank you for coming, and it's an honor that you're here. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, privilege to... I'm going to be rude and interrupt you right, right away. I also want to acknowledge Phyllis Chesler, who's a research fellow with ISGAP, who's uh, been working on these issues for many years. And, and Al Perlmutter is a member of our executive committee. So, so thank you very much. Oh, and. And Melissa Garber, who's a member of our board. Uh, all right, enough with the thanks. Um, <laughs> let me apologize in advance. I am not exactly known for my um, tact. And um, I think partly I became an Israeli because uh, they have no tact either. <laughs> um, is so uh, I'm going to say things that m may strike some people as harsh, particularly at the end when I get to the Jewish contribution to this problem. Um, in advance, my apologies if I offend you, but this is not one of those safe zones that the university is trying to create, or at least I'm not going to treat it that way. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the material in this talk is based on a long period of study of mine on issues of apocalypticism, millennialism, messianism, the whole complex of sort of end time uh, concerns. We will be having a conference at Boston University on May 3rd and 4th with which Richard Schoenfeld there on the back has helped me to organize and fund, um, which will be on the apocalyptic dimension of global jihad. Um, 
it should be extremely interesting and uh, I'm Charles will be at it and uh, those of you who are here will get announcements in their time so let me pass to my subject um, I, I'm not a public singer so I'm not going to sing this but imagine there's no countries mm -hmm. it isn't hard to do nothing to kill or die for and no religion to imagine 